The death of journalist Ned Day in early September seemed to touch each of us in a different way. Those of us here at Channel 8 lost a friend and a colleague. The criminal element of Las Vegas lost a powerful enemy. The little people of Las Vegas lost a tireless champion. Who was he? Where did Ned Day come from? How did he become one of the most influential people in the state in such a short period of time? For the past two months, George Knapp has been looking for the answers to those questions, from Ned's roots in Wisconsin to the sandy beaches of Hawaii, where it all came to an end. George is here with part one. George. Gary, Mary Ruth, and no matter how well you think you know someone, there are some things hidden beneath the surface that you can't possibly understand. This is especially true of Ned Day, who led a number of different lives with more ups and downs than a Col Coney Island roller coaster. Our purpose in exploring those lives is not to eulogize Ned or to glorify him, because frankly, parts of his life do not lend themselves to praise. We wanted to find out what drove him and how those influences affected the quality of life in our city. To do that, we had to begin on the cold, tough streets of Milwaukee for part one of our week-long series, The Inside Story of Ned Day. Milwaukee is a working man's town, a town of smokestacks and sausage factories, of beer drinkers and brisk winter winds. There are more than 1,500 neighborhood taverns here, one on every corner. It reminds you of the gritty town from the movie The Deer Hunter in more ways than one. The only thing bigger than beer in Milwaukee is bowling, a year-round sport that's regarded with near-religious fervor. Bowling is always big news, and the biggest of the bowlers was always Ned Day, a tough but stylish Hall of Famer who dominated the sport in the 30s and 40s, winning 10 world and national titles, bowling more perfect games than he could count, and winning a pile of prize money. In Milwaukee, you could not go anywhere and introduce yourself as Ned Day without somebody saying, are you related to Ned Day the bowler? I mean, you couldn't go anywhere. I had no idea that bowlers were, were this famous. Day made a fortune, and not only from competition. He owned pieces of several bowling alleys, starred in bowling movies, and wrote bowling books. It made life pretty easy for his wife, Frances, and son, Ned Jr. Young Ned was the only child of a well-to-do family and was given everything a boy could want. Parties, presents, trips to summer camp, it's been said many times that Ned Day was no Boy Scout, but he was a Cub Scout. In an ironic foreshadowing, Ned the Scout once took a field trip to see the Milwaukee Journal operation. For a few years, Ned's cousin, Tony Baraki, lived with the family in the modest house on South 92nd Street, West Allis. We played little cowboys and Indians and uh, Lionel trains. He had a whole big setup in his basement of all the, any equipment that you want for a train. Uh, he loved oatmeal. He used to eat oatmeal four, five, six times a day. Home life was hectic, though. Ned Sr. was always on the road. Francis was busy running the various businesses. And when Ned Jr. graduated from St. Aloysius, just down the street from his home, he was shipped off to St. John's Military Academy in Delafield, Wisconsin, a 104-year-old school steeped in tradition and very expensive. <laughs> Most of St. John's 200 or so male students are the sons of wealthy Midwesterners. They undergo rigorous physical and mental training in their four years here. It may sound hard to believe that such a notorious free spirit would be comfortable in the disciplined surroundings of a military academy, but he was. Ned not only tolerated his stay here at St. John's, he blossomed. It was a rocky start, however. In one of his first letters home, the lonely youngster told his mother, this place is the worst, really dead. My classes are slow and the food is really horrible. Right now, the dean is showing a boy and his parents the campus and is feeding them a pack of lies on how good this school is. But by his senior year, Ned was a top cadet, captain of his company, president of various clubs, a star golfer and football player, voted most popular cadet, the winner of numerous medals and awards. He'd learned to live by the St. John's mottos inscribed on the beacon in the center courtyard. Play the game, carry on, the game is not over until the whistle blows, and don't be a mollycoddle. One of his professors still remembers Ned Day 24 years after graduation. I remember Ned uh, from duty in the barracks in the evenings. He did, uh, he did have a famous father. A lot of our parents uh, are famous in their own right, and uh, that, would, that would not cause him any problems there at all. 
But for some reason, Ned did not go out for the St. John's bowling team, even though he had a 200 average himself. Perhaps it was an effort to escape the long shadow of his father, but it didn't work. After St. John's, he moved on to Madison, Wisconsin in college, a political science major. His father lived in Madison, his mother in West Dallas. Their marriage was all but over. Ned Jr. soon began to slip into the bowling lifestyle and away from academics. Within two years, he had quit school. He made a brief fling on the pro bowling tour, then drifted into a netherworld of bars, pool halls, and gambling. He ran a tout sheet, booked bets, and bartended at joints owned by the Milwaukee mob. At one topless bar owned by the Balistrieri family, he met an exotic dancer named Judy, a former Miss Nude America. They were married in 1972. The early 70s were tough times for Ned. His father, who'd become an alcoholic, died penniless. Ned Jr. passed some bad checks in order to pay off a bookie and was arrested. His marriage was disintegrating. It was at this lowest of points that Ned's godfather, an attorney, talked him into returning to school. He quit bartending and bookmaking, sold his diamond pinky ring, and took a job delivering pizzas for this West Allis eatery, named, coincidentally, Ned's Pizza. He applied to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. The family assumed he would once again major in political science and eventually become a lawyer. Ned always liked a good argument, and I think that's where I first got the impression. He didn't care if he was right or wrong, or you were right or wrong, as long as you could keep a conversation going and he would state his viewpoint and you'd state yours. But the application letter was intercepted by a journalism professor who at once recognized Ned's unique writing style and talked the 28-year-old would-be student into changing directions. Professor Charles Sykes took Ned under his wing and helped him land a job at a weekly newspaper in West Allis. Sykes died a few years ago, but his son, who was also just starting out, remembers Ned's transition from street scuffler to street reporter. Ned had clearly been I won't say part of the underworld, but uh, had had a very different life and existence. Um, he would talk about the fact that, uh, that you know, just a few years before, he'd been riding around in expensive cars, wearing fur coats and jewelry. And uh, he said, described himself as a gambler. He was a gambler. But he decided at some point in his life that he was going to get out of that. And uh, he dumped all of his former relationships. He got divorced and uh, with almost no money, went back to school. So by the time I met Ned, he was driving around in this crappy little Volkswagen, delivering pizzas, and uh, working on this weekly newspaper. It didn't take Ned long to catch on to the journalism trade. Tomorrow, we'll take a look at those early days and at the painful experiences that caused him to leave Milwaukee. It was two months ago today that our friend and colleague Ned Day died on a beach in Hawaii. As we told you yesterday, Ned's rise to prominence in the journalism world followed a highly unlikely path from military school to the pro bowling tour to bartending for mobsters and delivering pizzas. When he finally landed on his feet at a small Milwaukee newspaper, Ned knew that he had found his role in life. George Knapp picks up the twisted path that led Ned to Las Vegas in part two of our cover story series, The Inside Story of Ned Day. Those who remember the young Ned Day can recall a quiet, proper Catholic boy growing up in a quiet, proper Catholic neighborhood in West Dallas, Wisconsin. Yeah. He was quiet even when he was young. He was quiet and I always thought he was very quiet until I went to Las Vegas and found out he wasn't. It must be hard for anyone who knew Ned in his later years to imagine him as ever being a quiet type. But somewhere between boyhood and stardom, he acquired the skills of a master showman. No one was a better promoter of Ned than Ned, an ability he may have picked up from watching his famous father, the bowler, who used movies and books to keep his own legend alive long after his skills had faded. In any case, Ned Jr. was to put the same talents to good use in his newfound interest, journalism. He got into journalism at the insistence of a professor and soon found his niche. At the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee student newspaper, Ned quickly established his own identity. One early interview was with a hooker. Another article led to the firing of a professor. Within just a few months, Ned, the student, found out he could actually make money at being a reporter. This is where Ned landed his first job in journalism. Back in the early 1970s, it was headquarters of the West Alice Star. Today, it's a machine shop. Despite such humble beginnings, though, he knew even then that this was what he was meant to do. This was 1975, and we went out, and he and I together saw uh, all the president's men, and uh, we thought we were going to be Woodward and Bernstein. We're, we're raw reporters. 
um, and we took on what we thought were major corruption stories here in Milwaukee, and we went out at night, we visited people's houses, we went through public records. Sykes and Day were the holy terrors of West Dallas journalism, digging out minor scandals, embarrassing incompetent officials, playing it all by the seat of their pants. We were, we were working for the Post newspaper, making $160 a week, and thinking that we were hot shots, and knowing almost nothing about journalism, making it up as we went along. And uh, Ned was, was really sort of the inspiration for the rest of us. Despite his inexperience, Ned became the big fish in this very small pond. He made good use of his colorful contacts and shady past by scurrying through familiar haunts to come up with good stories. His nighttime job as a pizza delivery man provided the impetus for an hilarious feature article that was picked up and printed by the Milwaukee Journal. He moved up to the editorial page and often had his likeness featured in the weekly paper. Ned's baptism of fire was also the most painful experience of his life. He lived for a time with a stripper and part-time hooker named Lucida Restus, who had a 10-year-old daughter named Sue Lee. Ned was Sue Lee's godfather. In April 1976, the woman and child were found dead, strangled with a bicycle chain. For a while, Ned was a prime suspect in the killing, even though it was he who tearfully identified the lifeless bodies. He became obsessed with finding the real killer. He returned to all of his old hangouts, questioning strippers and bartenders, obtaining leads that were not given to the police. They all trusted Ned, they talked to him, and, and he began piecing it together. And within a matter of four or five days, he had sort of narrowed it down to some fellow who lived in Sheboygan. And he went up to Sheboygan and hung out with one of the photographers and got a picture of this guy at his house two days before he was actually arrested for murder. Now, whether the, the police would have, uh, would have figured it out without Ned, I don't know, but Ned cracked the case. There was just no question about it. William J. Heinen, the man convicted of the murders, is still in prison. Something went out of Ned, though, after the Sioux Lee killings. He became restless. His partner, Charlie Sykes, was hired away by the Milwaukee Journal, something Ned had wanted for himself and had probably deserved. Half of Ned would have liked to have made it here in Milwaukee, to have been a respectable reporter for the Milwaukee Journal as part of the establishment. Uh, I think he felt that with his background and the fact he didn't have a college degree that he would never really be accepted here. And, and, and he was probably right. I think there were a lot of ghosts here in Milwaukee for Ned, and that was one of the reasons why he uh, felt he had to leave. At the urging of a friend, Ned took a jaunt to Las Vegas. It was love at first sight. The town reminded him of all the years spent in bowling alleys, bars, and pool halls. He later told a reporter, Las Vegas is like a pool hall to the 400th power, the same basic environment just magnified. Ned decided to find a job here. He applied first to the Las Vegas Sun, but wasn't hired. An acquaintance suggested he try the small, struggling Valley Times, a North Las Vegas publication renowned for its bad checks, tough reporting, and strange characters. One of those was reporter Linda Cooper, now a public relations executive. And, and the Valley Times uh, was a, a collection of uh, uh, disparate journalists, and, and uh, we together formed a, sort of an ensemble journalism team, uh, which Bob Brown always uh, bemoaned the fact he didn't pay us enough to tell us what to write, so we all went off on our various ways and, and I think had a great little paper. Ned was introduced to publisher Bob Brown, who read the old pizza delivery article and hired him on the spot. Ned made only one demand, a corner desk. He got the job, the desk, and a whole new world to conquer. He liked the glitz, the glitter, the bimbos, the uh, lounge lizards. He he liked uh, uh, the movers and shakers and the fact that we were such a young, upstart city, and I think that was his kind of place. He was on his way. Tomorrow, Las Vegas stardom. George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. Ned's move from newspapers to TV was not always smooth. Tomorrow night, some of the things you didn't see, some of Ned's outtakes. Tonight, in part three of our special cover story series, The Inside Story of Ned Day, a look at the Las Vegas years. Ned arrived in Las Vegas in the fall of 1976. A short time later, he told a co-worker, also new in town, that the way Las Vegas is set up, they could both be famous in 10 years. The pretty strong stuff for a guy who drove an old beat-up Volkswagen, wore second-hand clothes, and worked at a struggling newspaper. But the prediction was, for the most part, true, even though Ned did it in less time. Tonight in part three of our series, George Knapp looks at how Ned made good on that promise to be a star. 
Ned Day was fond of saying that Las Vegas is the last great frontier boom town in America, and that, like all boom towns, is the kind of place that attracts the best and the worst of people. People who are upwardly mobile, ambitious, hungry. People like Ned Day himself. He started at the bottom, working as a beat reporter for a tiny North Las Vegas newspaper, earning $150 a week, trying to learn the ropes in what he saw as a ripe tomato of a city. His first Christmas here was spent in a topless bar on the Strip. His wardrobe was secondhand. We went to uh, the North Las Vegas Salvation Army where he found some wonderful buys. He found his uh, Jimmy Olsen flak jacket, which was a retread from Nellis, I suppose. He found lots of narrow little ties that he just loved and vests and corduroy wool, all kinds of plaid shirts. Uh, we outfitted him once in, in uh, a tuxedo for a date with uh, Angelique Pettyjohn, a burlesque queen, uh, whom he escorted to the player's ball once. And uh, all we needed was shoes to fit him and I think he rented those. The Jimmy Olsen jacket and the scraggly hair were soon fixtures at Las Vegas news events. Ned was getting a crash course in frontier survival, Las Vegas 101, and the professor was Valley Times publisher Bob Brown, a crafty and not altogether above board newsman who was intimately familiar with the city's infamous underbelly. Ned's relationship with Brown may have been the most influential of his professional career. He learned to love the old pro like a father. Brown gave the young upstart a free hand and his own column. The column, a mixture of Mike Royko, Hunter Thompson, and Jack Anderson styles, soon became must-reading for the Las Vegas elite. The new columnist specialized in exposés, land fraud in Pahrump, incompetence in state government, crooked doctors, shady political deals, and the workings of the Las Vegas mob. Ned uh, got to know the people in the federal building and he really cultivated them, made them see that they could trust him with their information. And uh, he was like their only friend. At other papers, they weren't that well received. Uh, there were some built-in biases against the feds in Nevada, and Ned didn't have that. The late 1970s marked the beginning of a major federal and state offensive against Las Vegas organized crime. The G-men were determined to weed all mobsters out of the gaming industry. Ned Day became an important player in that plan. He understood the mob from his own days as a mafia underling. He identified the gangsters, insulted them, dared to spotlight their operations and their shortcomings. To accuse them of being cowardly and to, to deliberately, he, he went out of his way to seek the most belittling language and the most belittling circumstances to portray this person in. And it was a very effective weapon, I think, in, in um, reducing the, the potency of these, these characters. Keeble knew the tactic well. For six years, he edited every column that Ned wrote for the Review Journal. The larger paper lured Ned away from Bob Brown when the columnist became bigger than the Valley Times itself. It was a painful decision, but the promise of a 25-fold increase in readership and a paycheck that didn't bounce was too powerful to resist. Uh, he, he left a part of him with Bob when he left the Valley Times to go to the RJ, but everyone understood why and nobody wanted to hold him back. The, the RJ has uh, suffered a little bit of a, a little bit from having a dull image anyway, and Ned was exactly the tonic it needed because it, it needed a, a fireball not just some writing platitudes. KLAS-TV also wanted this fireball, and at nearly the same time as the move to the RJ, the station hired Ned as its managing editor. Ned had frequently expressed his disdain for the pretty boys of TV news, perhaps because it was a role he seemed ill-suited for. He didn't look the part. Too many warts, not enough hairspray. Uh, he was very apprehensive about coming to work on television. He didn't feel that, that he was the classic television reporter or anchor. Uh, he had a Milwaukee accent, uh, he spoke with kind of nya nya nya, and he just didn't, he didn't feel comfortable in, 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 in front of the camera. We did uh, a couple of, uh, not rehearsals, but a couple of tryouts on him, and, and his hand was, was shaking so violently that uh, uh, he, was, he was very nervous in front of the camera. The thing I was able to tell him was, you just be Ned on camera as the same as you're off camera, don't change. Don't put on, don't put on a facade. Uh, uh, be what you are off camera, you are on camera, and you'll be accepted. Three, two, one. In addition to overseeing the Chicago Mobs Casino, three, two, one. It could be the plot line for a new bittersweet comic strip, Little Orphan Peggy. I'm talking about the Republican... What is going wrong today?
It's the pressure. My mother's in town. That's what it is. It but the Stardust skimming convictions, combined with Spilatro's departure from this life, have created a power of... But it didn't take long for Ned to live up to Stodall's expectations with his commentary slot, an anchor position, a widely read column, magazine articles, and public appearances. Ned's power and profile exploded. He did his utmost to live up to the image of the hard-drinking, hard-driving newsman, frequenting flashy night spots, dating flashy women, making good money, and spending every cent of it. His lifestyle changed, but his targets did not. He still went after big shots and bad guys. He turned up the heat on the local mob, and the mob returned the favor. There were barroom confrontations, death threats, acts of vandalism, and finally, the firebombing of his car, which was uninsured at the time. He mourned the loss of his ancient golf clubs, but refused to be intimidated. Uh, it does not demonstrate uh, a great deal of menace to sneak up in a parking lot in the dead of night and attack an un unarmed car. Okay, if that's the best that they have to offer, they don't scare me at all. Oh, he was gleeful about it. He was gleeful about it. There's no question about it. He, the, he that was one of uh, the, the column he wrote about the firebombing was one of those, uh, hey, hey, boss, look at this. Let me read you this line here, that thing. He loved it. Despite the bravado, many of Ned's associates often worried about his safety. Some are still convinced that his death was not from natural causes, but rather a professional hit. Tomorrow, a look at the fateful trip to Hawaii and the mystery woman who was there at the end. George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. Among those we'll hear from tomorrow night is Ned's longtime Las Vegas doctor who wonders what effect a much-publicized diet change may have had on his health. Ned Day's rise to prominence came with a price tag attached. Years of hard work, hard living, and hard drinking took their toll. In July, he tried to turn it around with a new diet and a new lifestyle, but this new man had only six weeks to live. Tonight, in part four of our cover story series, George Knapp looks at what really killed Ned and at the woman who was with him at the end. You see, the problem for me is that I'm a single man. Because I'm a single man and I'm overworked here at Channel 8, I don't have a lot of time to cook. I don't cook. I eat in restaurants, usually fast food restaurants, because I don't have a lot of time. And that's the problem. How do you lose weight when you eat fried burgers and drink a lot of Coca-Cola, not to mention whiskey? Ned Day made no secret of his bad habits. He also made no secret of it when he changed those habits. His visit to a local diet clinic was made into a series of news reports. The experts told him he must change his diet, eliminate the booze, or face the consequences. Otherwise, he'll be at very high risk for having a stroke, having a heart attack, or having the arthritis and uh, kidney stone problems. We want you around. This prophetic warning wasn't the first for Ned. A year before his death, he underwent a comprehensive series of tests under the direction of his longtime physician, Elias Ghanem. There was no evidence of heart disease at the time, but Ghanem urged him to quit smoking and lose weight. He didn't. Ned sometimes confided in friends that he knew he had a bad heart. It was a stroke that killed his father years before, and one month before his death in Hawaii, he experienced violent heart spasms, according to a neighbor. The neighbor says Ned cried out on the phone, I I'm having a heart attack, but then refused to call in paramedics. Could a radical change in his lifestyle or diet have precipitated the more serious problems? When some people just uh, go, like I said again, on a special diet and they go into a very cold situation, even if he was swimming early in the morning, as I understand it, and it, he could have had some coronary spasm, which have caused him to have the arrhythmia, and uh, it would have uh, led to his death. The diet doctor maintains that Ned started too late in trying to turn his health around, that various risk factors were against him from the beginning. Enter Mary Ottman, a leggy brunette from Kansas City who works as a commercial pilot. She met Ned on a local golf course in mid-July. He was smitten. Well, I saw those scuffed up shoes and I said, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy making these eyes at me? <laughs> Perhaps he was overdue for a serious romance. Perhaps he was concerned about his own mortality. In either case, Ned fell head over heels. There was talk of marriage and the future. And there was Hawaii. 
Ned had been stretching himself pretty thin with his columns, anchor work, and public appearances. He needed the time off. His trip almost ended, though, before it began, an omen of sorts. He and Mary were stuck at the airport for nine hours trying to get a flight to the islands. Las Vegas Ava Rourke snapped this photo of Ned at the airport as he was writing a blistering column about the experience. But finally, the happy couple made it to Hawaii. They golfed every single day and even made a videotape of their play on one hole. It was, uh, it was a typical, you know, romantic vacation. It was, it was wonderful. We both talked about it being the most wonderful week of both our lives. They acted like a couple of crazy kids, hopping from island to island and restaurant to restaurant. On the final night, they had dinner at the Proud Peacock. The owner remembers that Ned couldn't seem to stop working even then. And he was trying to uh, get as much information as he could. He was just kind of like thinking about what he would write about of the whole islands and, and, and everything he'd seen. And it was like an enormous amount of knowledge he was trying to gain in a very, very short time. This is the view from the hotel Ned stayed at during his vacation. It's exactly why he came to the islands. The beautiful sunsets, the sandy beaches, the cool trade winds, the gentle people. He found all of that, but he found something else as well. Vacation or not, Ned was compelled to work. He researched a story about Japanese investments in Las Vegas. In this photo, he's writing what turned out to be his final column for the Review Journal. At the suggestion of a Las Vegas friend, Ned and Mary drove to Hanama Bay one morning to try their hand at snorkeling. Of course, the idea of Ned snorkeling to anybody who knew him was probably fairly outrageous. But of course, he liked that too. Ned sat down at the water's edge and strapped on his gear as Mary snapped this picture, his last. Seconds later, he waded in, along with throngs of other tourists there to see the reef and fish. After they'd swallowed enough seawater, they decided to head back to the beach, Mary in the lead. When she got to her towel, she turned around, expecting to see Ned. The next thing that came into my frame of vision was uh, two lifeguards pulling under one under each arm of a man pulling him to shore. And on my second look, you know, I froze, of course, at that point, praying against all uh, prayers that it wouldn't, that it wasn't Ned. One lifeguard who administered CPR recalled Ned's last words. It was no time for eloquence. People around him asked if he was okay, responded no, no, and toppled into the water. Uh, the people in the water at that time supported him until we were able to arrive and bring him to shore. Although emergency vehicles were on the scene almost immediately, it was 45 minutes before Ned arrived at Queen's Hospital. The emergency room supervisor says time was not a factor in the outcome. It really should not have because of the fact that the uh, CPR was initiated immediately at the scene. We arrived at the hospital and they continued to work on him. And 20 minutes later, the doctor came in and said, he's dead. By the time Ned's body arrived at a Honolulu funeral home, news of his death was already spreading. It hit Nevada like a Pacific tidal wave. Good evening, everybody. This is the toughest story we've ever had to report, so bear with me. Channel 8 anchorman Ned Day is dead. Police say he collapsed on the beach of a popular snorkeling area. We have lost a friend and fellow newscaster who loved life and loved reporting on it. Ned was a friend as well as a colleague. Most callers want to know about foul play in Ned's death. There was no foul play. The doubts still linger, however. They are almost certainly unfounded. Honolulu police were informed of Ned's reputation and were on the lookout for anything suspicious. Dr. Mary Flynn, who conducted the autopsy, was cautious in arriving at her conclusions. Her official report, issued weeks later, is firm in its finding that heart disease was the culprit. Ned was at the high end of virtually every risk category for heart disease, had a personal history and a family history of heart problems. There are many people who may have wanted him dead, but they were not to blame for what happened at Hanama Bay. It may be time to finally put aside such suspicions, which is how Ned would have wanted it. Ned and I had talked about dying and about death. He was not afraid of dying. We're going to miss him very much. My job? Get the skinny, get it right, and tell it. That simple. Ned may be gone, but he lives on in different ways. Tomorrow night, in the conclusion of our series, we'll look at the legacy of Ned Day. 
Death of Channel 8 anchorman Ned Day two months ago was a traumatic event for those of us who knew him well and for Las Vegans in general. We told you at the beginning of our week-long series that it was not our intention to present Ned as some heroic, larger-than-life figure. The only thing is, he was larger than life. Now, we've tried to balance our reports by showing his various sides, military cadet, bowler, bookie, bartender, hustler, pizza deliverer, and finally journalist. The sum total of those various roles made up the Ned Day we knew and whose legacy is still with us. George Knapp joins us now with the conclusion of our series. George? Gary, Mary Ruth, Ned probably would have pretended to be embarrassed by the word legacy, but he certainly left one. He set the parameters himself in a letter written to his mom and grandmother just shortly after first arriving in Las Vegas 11 years ago. He wrote, I know that some things I have done in the past have served to dishonor you both, but those days are behind me. I may never be rich, but I do plan to be the best damn newsman possible. I think it's safe to say that he lived up to that pledge. The memorial service held for Ned Day could have easily ranked as the social event of the season. Governors were there, and senators, lawmen, and ad men, friends, co-workers, gamblers, competitors, public servants, journalists, and judges, people who knew him well and not so well. It was almost as if Ned himself was in charge of invitations. The only thing missing was Ned. What a great column he could have written about his own funeral. There were words of comfort and praise, of course, but few exaggerations. But you made government better here. You made them be more compassionate, consider their decisions much more carefully, and you made them care. We will always be grateful for the tremendous contribution your son made to make Las Vegas a better place to live in. What have we learned about this man, this man who made our city a better place to live? We know that the whole was the sum of its parts, that the Ned Day we knew was created a piece at a time along the way. He was the son of a famous man, a man who lived hard and died young. We know the son tried too late to avoid a similar fate. We know he was a mob underling, a bookie, who later atoned for his petty crimes by helping to run the mob out of Las Vegas. We know that he married one stripper and lived with another, and that he later was passionate in his defense of individual freedom, even the freedom to shed one's clothing in public. We know that he was down on his luck for years, penniless, powerless, alone, and that nothing in later life excited him more than helping out the little people of the world. And we know that he was a military cadet who learned early on the importance of playing the game. Oh, did he play the game. He knew the parameters of the audience. He knew the parameters of the RJ policies. But he also pushed things right to the limit. He, was, he wrote to the firewall all the time. I think that growing up under the shadow of, of his father, who was the world champion uh, in his field, it had to drive him a little bit. And so I think there was always that little bit of having a chip on your shoulder of showing that, you know, I don't have the college degree and I'm not from the right side of the tracks and I'm a little rough around the edges and, and I'm still I'm better than you. I'm going to show you. It's no exaggeration to say that Ned influenced a generation of Nevada journalists, but influenced them how? One way is by reminding us of the wonder of language, the joy of nuance, cadence, syntax, the limitless power of words. But his love of the language was a beyond description. You think of a, of a street scuffler somehow turning around to love the language. It's an odd combination. You don't, you don't find it very often. Well, Ned Day, while it's probably safe to say you didn't start the rivalry between Reno and Las Vegas, you certainly did enliven it a bit last fall when you wrote, and I quote, about that dingy, dim-witted, ear-picking, toe-wiggling, bum-scratching, hog-calling, flat-headed, slack-jawed, buck-toothed, yahoo-invested, Yahoo infested Berg of a settlement. And he went on to say that Reno ought to be called the flat brainwave capital of the world. Uh, is that because it's smaller than Las Vegas? It's amazing how insightful I was back then. He reminded us of the importance of laughing, especially at ourselves. Ned always laughed loudest when the joke was on him. When they blew up his car, he laughed at the bumper stickers. The, the fact is that somebody set my car on fire. It's not the end of the world. He admittedly was a walking, breathing self-parody, a caricature of himself, and he played the part to the hilt. 
Ned, let's talk about these Bambi posters. Well, you know, Dave, well, you Should know, they I, have been banned? I, I, I broke that story, Dave. No, I, I broke it. Ned, Dave, <laughs> me. I broke the story on Bambi, okay? And as a matter of fact, I was having lunch the other day with the governor. You know, the governor of the state of Nevada, Richard Bryan, he and I were talking about it. He taught us that journalism has nothing to do with good looks or pancake makeup or moose for men, that it takes guts and sweat and long hours. He had a personality. He had a persona. There was a quality about him that was bigger than life. And I felt that it would work on television. I felt that he could communicate on television. Even if it, yeah, 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 people would listen to him because he had content. He was the thing, he was believable. And I think that for everybody who worked with Ned, it changed them in the way they went about their jobs. They went about it with a little bit more determination, a little bit more aggressiveness, a little bit more, a little bit more sense of fun, too. So Ned has left behind him, you know, in Milwaukee, as I'm sure just as much in Las Vegas, scattered all over the place in newsrooms around town, people who um, would think of themselves in some way as uh, disciples of the Ned Day style of journalism. Uh, a character that we will never see again. And I hope that nobody tries to uh, fill Ned Day's shoes or take his place, because it's not going to happen. It would just be a death sentence for whoever that person is. Ned was very special. But no, there's, there's never a Ned Day. Ned came in a unique package. He had a, uh, a unique set of talents and unique courage. Everything about him was, was different from anyone I've ever worked, I have ever worked with. It is the most important thing that news people do maximize the flow of information to the people. If we get into the business, we in the news media, get into the business of censoring the flow of information to the people, what we do is rob you of your ability to make decisions and to take responsibility for your own life. If we do that, we rob you of your freedom. Because once I've set the precedent that I, Ned Day, know what it is that you ought to know, and at the same time know certain things that you're better off not knowing because I, Ned Day, know that you're better off not knowing them. You're better off not knowing about the existence of the stealth plane. You're better off not knowing about the Bay of Pigs invasion because I know what's in your best interests. Leave it to me, Ned Day. I know what's in your best interests. Ned always ended his news pieces with a verbal signature. I thought you'd like to know I'm Ned Day. You might like to know that those are the words being engraved on his headstone. We have to admit there was a selfish motive in doing these reports about Ned's life. His passing has been a little hard to shake for us here and for a lot of you out there. By putting things into perspective, by trying to answer some of the lingering questions, we hope to exorcise from some ghosts from our lives and from yours. And I think it's time to get on with things. Okay. There's one other legacy. There certainly is, as, as you both know. Something, uh, of a little more tangible nature. Uh, Mary Ottman, the woman who went to Hawaii with Ned and who may have become his wife, it says she is carrying Ned's child, a child that was conceived during the trip to Hawaii and which is expected sometime in the spring. So indeed, Ned Day does live on. He sure does. Thank you, George. It was great.